For those devices out there, there, there's one thing that's been missing in the market for years. In addition to CPAP, you remember I said single level pressure, the bi-level is the dual level, levels of pressure. There's an inspiratory pressure and an expiratory pressure. I want people to realize that CPAP, A, doesn't cure anything. CPAP doesn't help you breathe. CPAP makes the work of breathing easier. Simple concept, but very important. Where a bi-level device helps you do the work. It helps you breathe. Now, a lot of medics out there are going to think that bi-level is better because every time they get to the hospital, the doctors change them to bi-level. Well, then it must be better. That's not actually true. They're different. They're going to do different things, generally for different patients. You have a hypoxic difficulty breathing, which is generally a CPAP candidate. You can have a hypercapnic or high CO2 difficulty breathing, which is more for a bi-level. But if you think about it, a lot of your patients don't call you at the first sign of a problem. They've waited all day. They're going to call you at night when they can't sleep, so they're going to make sure that you can't sleep. They're going to call you out, but they're running out of gas and they're getting tired. They have probably reached the point where they need the help that a CPAP device cannot offer. So why aren't you carrying a bilevel device now? They're out there. You see them in the hospitals. Generally, you don't see a mini EMS because it's capital piece of equipment. A bi-level ventilator can be as much as a $15,000 item. Trust me, I don't believe you're going to find that on, on your transport units or in EMS. But that's about to change. Mercury Medical has developed the first and only totally disposable bi-level device on the planet. And we want to introduce what we call FlowSafe 2 Plus. Now you can see if you compare it to a FlowSafe 2, they're dramatically different. Obviously to the eye they look, geez, this looks very complicated. Trust me, it is not. One of the advantages of all FlowSafe devices, it only has two parts. Most everybody knows where the mask is going to go and the device goes here. There's no other way to put it together. You, you can't get it wrong. It comes in a very compact packaging so that it fits into your first end bags, uh, easy to store, uh, whether you're storing it in a hospital, storing it on your vehicle. So, and then people look at it and they say, boy, that looks like it would really be heavy. And it looks, it looks like it might be. Trust me, it's not. It's actually a very light device. The difficulty in developing a bi-level device, and I want you to think about this, is that you have to have a device that knows whether the patient is inhaling or is exhaling. How do I do that? A lot of those devices have sensors. They have electronics. They have flow diverters and know whether the patient is inhaling because valves change. You're not going to find any of that on the bi, uh, our bi-level device, on the FlowSafe 2 Plus. There's no uh, sensors, there's no batteries, there's no electronics whatsoever to do that. So how does that happen? I, I was pretty amazed when the engineers called me down and they said, we think we've got this figured out. They took a very complex problem and came up with a very simple solution. It was absolutely amazing. Uh, now, it's very, it might be difficult to see on the camera, but there's actually a pink area right here. And what that pink area is, is basically the hub of a needle. The needle kind of points in this direction towards this blue block. That needle has the jet stream going through it. When a patient inhales, it points in one direction, and when they exhale, it points in a different direction. By directing the flow into this block, which has two holes, it goes to one of these two diaphragms, which changes the pressure. It's all mechanical. The patient does it. So we took this thing, it was like everybody's trying to figure out how do we do this and then keep it to where it would be disposable, where people would be throwing it away. That was what everybody wanted. So every doctor that we have talked to, that's what they want. They want a bi-level device. The medics, they want bi-level device. Respiratory therapists. If you go to a hospital and they look at their uh, number of bi-level ventilators, 
They don't have that many. What do we do during flu season that we're going on right now when we run out of machines? What do we do? Now, I'm not going to try to tell you that this is the same as a bi-level ventilator. It doesn't have a backup rate. It doesn't have any alarms. There's no timed rate. It has none of that. So it's not replacing a $15,000 ventilator. But it does more than what a plain CPAP device does. It's that gap patient that goes between CPAP and being on a ventilator. That's the patient that we're looking at here to do that. So not only does this do bi-level, this is also a CPAP device. You have a switch here that you can change it from bi-level to CPAP. So you're basically getting two devices in one based on what your patient needs, and it can be brought to the patient's side. So it comes with the deluxe mask, and we greatly recommend that it's used with the deluxe mask. We have found that other masks that may not seal as well is going to impact how well the product actually works. So the deluxe mask is extremely important to do that. Now you'll notice that it does not have an integrated nebulizer like a FlowSafe 2EZ. The only way to do a breathing treatment or a nebulizer treatment, you would have to do it like a FlowSafe 2 and put a T-piece in between and do your nebulizer that way. But you can only give a breathing treatment while it's in the CPAP mode. If you add the extra flow from a nebulizer while it's in the bi-level mode, it kind of tricks the device and it won't function as, as it's needed. As you do this, and we're going to demonstrate this in, in just a few minutes, it's very important that you follow some exact steps or the device will not function as designed. But there's a couple of things you need, a couple of terms you need to understand. IPAP is the inspiratory positive airway pressure and the EPAP is the expiratory positive airway pressure. Remember, this is going to have two, so you're going to have an IPAP and you're going to have an EPAP. A typical order for bi-level that a physician may write that may be in your protocol, they're going to give you two numbers. They're going to give you commonly a good place and safe place to start would be a 10 over 5. 10 is your IPAP. That's your inspiratory pressure. The smaller number, the 5, will be your EPAP or expiratory pressure. Another term is called pressure support. Pressure support is the delta, the difference between those two numbers. The advantage of being able to do this and how it helps the person breathe. Remember, CPAP doesn't help you breathe. It makes the work of breathing easier. Bi-level helps you breathe. So how it does this, when it clicks from the EPAP of 5 to an IPAP of 10, that little kick helps the patient inhale. So it helps them do the work. The lower resistance that they're exhaling again also makes their life better because it reduces the work of breathing. Some people believe that all of the patients that would CPAP could probably be on a bi-level. I'm not sure I would really want to travel down that path. I think we need to know which of these patients are better for a CPAP device. Remember I mentioned the, the hypoxic. Generally, these are your heart failure patient type, type folks as compared to your COPD five-pack-a-day smoker are probably more of a hypercapnic. Use your entitled CO2 to monitor that. Use your pulse oximetry to monitor that. Now, I just mentioned entitled CO2. For all of the flow safe devices, there's two ways you could try to measure entitled CO2, whether you want to do capnometry, which is a number, or capnography, which is a graph. If you tried to use the connector for entitled CO2 that goes on an endotracheal tube, it will actually fit between the flow safe valve and the mask. It would fit in, the, in between the two. But I can tell you that's not very effective. The gas flow going through the valve is so fast, it washes the CO2 out, so therefore your graph is not going to be uh, of any value. For those that look at EKGs, your graph will end up looking like a coarse V-fib. Clinicians will know what that is, and that's of no value to you. Your number, your capnometry, 
would probably be a little bit lower than expected, but could be used for trending. The correct way, I believe, and, and the, the most accurate way to measure in title is to use the cannula style in title CO2 gas lines. It would go under the mass, so you gotta think about it as you go to apply this. It's gotta be on the patient beforehand, obviously. And because of the, the good double seal on the mask, the tubing coming out of it from the gas line well, doesn't appear from everything that we've gotten feedback from the field and from what I've personally seen, does not create a problem. I believe all of these patients should be on entitled CO2. So make it part of your protocol, make it part of your practice, is to go ahead and get that cannula on as you're going through the process to put it on. So that's, there's a couple of other options that we have with, with FlowSafe. One of the things that comes into play as I mentioned earlier, a lot of times in other countries, they don't like the high oxygen percentage that patients are getting. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of that in the U.S. We've had some people that are interested in it. So we came up with a 35% FiO2 elbow that can go into the mask. So if this is placed into the mask and the valve is placed on the end, you actually have an additional hole here that's going to bring in some room air, so that you're going to mix another uh, percentage of 21% into your gas supply. So it's going to give you a, a average for the average patient right around 35%. If you remember I said earlier, without that valve, it was going to be somewhere around 74 to 75, so that there would be an, an advantage there for those that are concerned about the FiO2 that they're giving the patient. Now. For the EMS folks and for the people in the ER, a lot of times if your EMS agency is using FlowSafe and they get to the hospital and the patient just is not doing as well as, as, as you would like and they're going to put them on a, 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 a V60 or a Vision, some type of a, a bi-level ventilator, typically they have to throw away the FlowSafe device, throw the mask away which is already fit on the patient, working fine, got a good seal, and it seemed like kind of a waste because now they're going to need about a $25 to $30 mask, which they generally cannot bill for, so what do you do? The problem with, with this setup is those ventilators require a vented mask. This is a non-vented mask. And I know it's not a concern to, to EMS folks in general, uh, but it is part of the cost, but it is a concern to the respiratory therapist to have to go back and fit a mask on a patient to get a new seal, may type several masks to get that accomplished. So you, there is a way to turn this into a very close version of a vented mask. You need two things. You have to have an anti-asphyxia valve, which this does not have, and you've got to have a, a valve that is able to flush the CO2 out of the mask, which this does not have. Because remember, I told you this was an open system, so it doesn't need any of those things but the other devices the hospital use does. So we have a different valve that can actually be placed into the mask. Generally, hospitals purchase these because they're trying to turn this mask to be acceptable in, in the ventilators that they have. And the circuit that they use will have the flow valve that will flush out the CO2. And then the respiratory therapist knows how to deal with it. So instead of scrapping everything that was just done, they could use this to use it to the equipment that they have in the hospital. So it, it is an advantage to have that, but somebody's got to go in and, and tell them about that. What we're hoping is that that group of patients between CPAP and a ventilator will do fine on a FlowSafe 2 Plus, and they won't have to use the more expensive device. Some of these patients don't need that level of capability. And to use this device, you don't need to be a respiratory therapist. For those other devices, you really should be a respiratory therapist. They go to school for years to manage the, the complexity of those devices. This is a very simple, easy device to use. So I think everybody's going to be pleased with this performance and, and how well it works. Now, with all that said, the next step is I'd like to move into demonstrating FlowSafe 2+. The next step in our process of going over the FlowSafe 2 Plus is actually show how to demonstrate it and how to set it up. 
Now, I want you to remember that these patients are in distress. They're not in failure. You do have some time to do this. It's not like you're going to be doing CPR. You're not ventilating these patients. Remember, we've got to get this right. There's important steps to do this. One of the greatest factors in the success of CPAP is not always the device. It's the clinician. It's the coaching. How do you work for them? How do you work with them? Remember, these patients are probably having the worst day that they've had. They've been short of breath. They're working hard. They could be confused. They could be hypoxic, short of oxygen, uh, and just really are having a rough time. So coaching is huge. So I'm going to introduce my, my patient here. This, this is Scott Horowitz. Uh, he also works with me here at Mercury Medical. He's been kind enough to be the patient. So we're going to demonstrate FlowSafe 2 Plus. As you remember when, we, when I discussed it earlier, is you've got to start out in the CPAP mode, which I've already done. It does come out of the package that way because we think that is so important that we do that. Now, I want you to remember that IPAP and that EPAP. When you have somebody in a CPAP mode only, single pressure, that is technically going to be your IPAP pressure. Okay? So we're going to start out in the CPAP mode so that we do that. Now, if I was going to be treating Scott here, he's gonna, he was going to be my patient. I would be already, we've done some assessments, we've already decided this is the direction that we're going to go. I'd be telling them this is what we're going to do. This is going to help you breathe. This is going to make things easier for you. A lot of times I even like to kind of put a hand on somebody and you're talking to them. Clinicians have kind of gotten away from that. I think it's important that we develop a rapport between the caregiver and the patient. They're looking for you to solve a problem. What are our patients looking for us in EMS? I think there's really two things they're looking for. Generally, they want to arrive to the hospital, and they want to feel better. And sometime, how I deal with people helps them feel better. Okay? So to me, I would explain what we're going to do. And I've got the mask here. I always tell people to invert the head harness. Don't walk in and just strap it on somebody's face. You do that, and you're gonna, the anxiety level is going to go through the roof. I always suggest is whoever gets a rapport with the patient, stay with them. You're the one that's working with them. Don't go off and write a report. Don't talk on the radio. Don't have a con conversation about the latest football game while this is going on. They'll get, they're gonna, anxiety levels are going to get high. There's going to be a problem. So I go ahead and I, I invert the mask. I put together, remember, there's only two parts. It can only go one way. Now, based on the sticker, since I've got this in CPAP mode, remember this is going to be like a flow safe too. Eight liters should get me five of CPAP. I always tell people to start low, work their way up. Five is a safe place. That's a safe zone. Generally, I'm not going to cause any harm to somebody by putting them on five of CPAP. So I'm going to turn the tank on here in a minute. I'm going to put it on eight, and I'm going to try to get Scott to hold it. But I really want to get them on the device, have it functioning with a CPAP of five. So I'm going to turn my, my tank is already on. I'm going to turn it up to eight. Now, you, you might be able to hear some of that sound. It does get a little bit noisy, but every CPAP device gets noisy strictly because of the gas flow. So I always tell the patient, I try to get them to hold it. I want them to feel like they have some control in what's going on, and I try to get them to put it up to their face. Now, if they want to pull it away, that's okay. Remember, the patient's in distress. They're not in failure, all right? So if I can get him to put it up to his face and say that's all he'll do, he doesn't want the strapping, the device will work. But now I have to look at my manometer to see if it's actually working because the manometer will not register until it's got a seal on the patient's face. So I get that on there, I try to get him a little bit tighter, and I actually have him on five, okay? Now, what I wanna do so that everybody on camera can see this, now this does not come with the FlowSafe device. This is for demonstration purposes only, but I'm going to put the larger manometer that you can see there on the table. Now you see, notice as he does that, I want to see what you're actually getting there. We're right on about five. I would like to 
pressure to be a little bit more consistent, so I'm going to turn it up. Now you'll notice the needle moves. It's not going to stay exactly on the number because as you breathe, you're changing the intrathoracic pressure in your chest, so you're going to have some fluctuations. But I want a kind of a mean average right around five, and I kind of like that. So once I get him to where he'll stay on it and everything's fine, now I can take the head harness and bring it over. Always be careful of their ears. On the flow safe too, you want to hit that these pinchers here, which pulls it, makes that, you'll notice that the forehead piece actually went to his forehead. And now I can actually use the four points that are Velcroed to actually, where he no longer has to use his hand. you notice I think my pressure probably should still be staying around five, which we're doing pretty good. So now I know that I'm not, he's not over breathing it. It's not going to zero when he inhales. I got a good mass seal. It's registering, so I'm happy with that. Now I'm considered I want to go to a bi-level. I want to go to two levels to do that. For this device, I recommend for it to actually work best, I'm going to make this a CPAP. Now remember, I'm not in bi-level yet. I want to make this a CPAP of 10. So how do I do that? I'm going to turn my flow up. Okay. Once I've done that, I've got a CPAP of 10. That is your IPAP. That's your inspiratory pressure. It's now set. So when I flip this switch to bi level, okay, I still got my inspiratory right there when the inhale's up at the 10. You'll notice it's going down, but I really want it on a 5. To adjust that, there's a little disc here labeled EPAP that I adjust that. Okay, so you'll notice I've got an average of 10 on the inspiratory and an average of 5 on the expiratory. He is now on bi-level. It is helping him do the work. So it's a significant advantage to be able to do that. Now, if I wanted to do a breathing treatment, I would have to put it in line where my manometer is teed in now, but I would have to go back to the CPAP for this to actually work or we're going to fool the device. So this should make it much more comfortable for him to do that. To use FlowSafe 2 Plus, it's very important that we follow those steps as I outlined there. Start in CPAP. Start it at 5. Make sure your mask is not leaking. Make sure he's not drawing it down to 0. Then adjust your CPAP up to 10. If everything still stays fine, it's still not leaking, then you can flip your switch to bi-level and adjust your EPAP. And that's really all there is to it. Now, maybe when they get to the hospital, you may have to explain to them what this is because we're, it, it's, it, this is really new and it's out there. And we're also looking at using an elbow in this location where the device is more straight down than coming straight out. That was an option that somebody, people could do. They found this to look a little almost like a, the beak on a, on, a, on a bird or something, it looks kind of, kind of awkward, so you could actually do that. So that's the FlowSafe 2 Plus. This has been Steve LaCroix with Mercury Medical. If you have any questions, you can go to our, uh, our new website at uh, mercurymed.com, or you can send me an email. My email address is slacroix, that's L-E-C-R-O-Y, at mercurymed.com. I hope this has been helpful and very informational. Uh, look forward to hearing from some folks. Give it a try. You'll find this to be an excellent product, and I think your patients will be better for it. Have a good day.